I could not be more delighted to be here and to share some ideas and some thoughts and perhaps some future possibilities of enabling the third industrial revolution to take hold here in the Basque region and in Spain more generally. I especially look forward to the round table with my colleagues Manuel Torres and Javier Boyo. I think that will produce some useful insights on steps ahead. Already in the few days I've been here, I've had some very engaging conversations with a number of people from Technalia. I have been quite impressed at the resource that Technalia offers the region, and I think there is a way forward, a way that we might think about the value-added business plan that can take the very rich ideas, the very intriguing possibilities that are being researched and studied here at Technalia and bring them forward into the regional economy to the benefit of of uh, Spain and, and, the, and the Basque region. How to think of my talk here today? Yes, I'm going to talk about what I call the imperative and opportunity of the third industrial revolution. But this is not so much really a speech, I hope, but the beginning of a dialogue. And there are two ways I want to introduce this idea. First, um, perhaps because I'm talking to a rather technical audience, I want to introduce the idea in the context of Richard Feynman, who was a Nobel laureate um, in the world of physics. He was also a Caltech physicist. And in 1959, he gave a most remarkable speech. That talk was called Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And I suggest this might be a very useful metaphor for our discussions here in our continuing dialogue. Plenty of Room at the Bottom. I provided the website here. Although a physicist, although very skilled in mathematics, I'm happy to say there's not a single equation in this talk. I've given you the link to download it and to read it. In 1959, Richard Feynman was talking about the possibility of storing the entire encyclopedia on the head of a pen. There is indeed that much capacity, that much opportunity, if we step back and imagine and really take a firm understanding of the world around us and explore the possibilities. Imagine the head of a pen containing the entire Encyclopedia Britannica. Now this was in 1959 before IBM scientist Don Eigler learned how to manipulate with a scanning microscope cesium atoms under the microscope to spell out the words IBM. That happened in 1989. So he was beginning to imagine possibilities and it was that imagining of possibilities that allowed many of the ideas that we're not working actively here today to actually take place. First the imagination and then the action. And it is in that spirit that I hope we'll be able to continue that discussion. So I encourage you to take a look at that very remarkable essay. It's informed a lot of my thinking for almost 20 years now. But secondly, as I was sitting at dinner last night with um, a number of colleagues, Asier, Daniela Velte, um, Jesus de la Quintana, I got a message from my partner, Kate Lackey is her name. She specializes in what we call brain injuries and developmental disorders. She works with clients who have difficulties seeing and understanding and how to interpret and read and make sense of ideas in their mental capacity. And she sent me a text last night. She is working with a remarkably bright, very lovely seven-year-old young lady, we'll call her Abigail, who is missing part of her brain. The brain is called the corpus callosum. That is the part of the brain that brings the two hemispheres together, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. As you know, perhaps, uh, the right hemisphere tends to be more the creative part of the brain. The left hemisphere tends to be more the mechanistic, the orderly, logistical, lo logic part of the brain. And Abigail is missing that part of the brain that integrates. So she's having enormous difficulty reading and understanding, but she's a brave little girl. And my colleague, my, my partner Kate, is working with her in helping her grow new neural networks. Before the 1990s, we thought the brain had a fixed capacity. You were born with a certain number of neurons, a certain number of links, and that was your intelligence to develop. But we've known for many years, and particularly since the early 1990s, that in fact there is new capacity to develop different linkages, to regrow some of that neuron in the capacity for new intelligence, that capacity for seeing new things in different ways. 
And this is what Kate is working with Abigail to bring forward and to develop new ways of her understanding. She does not read as we would read. We tend to read with the left side of the brain. We see the words and they're orderly to us and we uh, put them in context. She sees with her right side of the brain, so she sees images. So she's learning to read by imagining and seeing the image of words and how they might look in contrast, a different way of reading. And the reason I tell this story, because it's not only a remarkable story of a seven-year-old girl who has very big ambitions and she so badly wants to read. Just yesterday she told her dad, her dad is a fireman, a very average person, Daddy, I read a whole page today. And Kate said to her, you read the whole story. And she just gave a biggest grin because somebody was willing to work with her, somebody was willing to take the patience and teach her new ways of reading even with this missing part of her brain. I'm suggesting that in many ways, technalia may be the corpus callosum of the left and the right hemispheres of our economy. We have the right hemisphere, the artistic, the social, the empathic connections. We have the left hemisphere, which is the information, the way we see the world, the logic of how we want to operate. And very often, we have disconnections. We're not able to make linkages. We're not able to reach across one hemisphere to the other. And technology may be, in fact, the way to bridge that gap. Also in the immediate sense, yes, but in the historical sense, we have traditions, we have previous understandings, we tend to operate on information that we knew yesterday, but we need to constantly update that information and bring it forward to imagine the future, to imagine what I call the imperative and the opportunity of the third industrial revolution. So it's in that spirit, my talk, should be seen more as a way of bridging a number of different gaps, of bringing the right hemisphere of the brain together with the left hemisphere, bringing traditions together with the need for future development in ways that provide a social well-being that we can be proud of and ways that can build a sustainable economy. So it's in that spirit I offer these thoughts here today. Let me provide this opening perspective. Here I'm building on the work of my colleague Robert Ayers. Some of you may know in more of the physics and the technical side, Bob is a mathematical physicist who has done a lot to lay the foundation for what we call industrial ecology. By that we mean economists tend to think about taking a little bit of labor and a little bit of investment we call capital. We have a recipe for the economy and Bob and I would say, well, Actually, yes, labor and capital, but also energy and resources. Because if you're not efficiently using energy and resources, you may actually be constraining capital and labor and have a much weaker economy than you might otherwise. So I'm building on the work of my colleague, Bob Ayers. The evidence is beginning to show that the lagging improvements in what we call exergy efficiency we can think about this as energy efficiency, but the correct term, as the engineers and physicists and chemists will, will know, is exergy efficiency. Exergy is the high quality availability of energy to do work, to move objects, to transform matter into goods and services. And in fact, as we will see in a moment, the inability to make improvements on converting exergy into useful work, we can think of it as energy efficiency, if you'd like, uh, has been among the reasons we're seeing a slowing economy. And I will show you some numbers in that regard. So the diminishing improvements in energy efficiency is among the reasons we're seeing a lagging economic productivity. A social and economic transformation, both a social and an economic transformation is clearly needed, driven by what I call purposeful effort, not just wild, crazy ideas, but directed purposeful effort to move the social and the economic transformation along. That includes smart and directed actions. That means we have to take a step back, linking the left and the right brains together with a purposeful movement forward. So smart and directed actions, as well as the very big targeted investments to improve energy productivity. And to guide this purposeful effort, we need much more than a conventional supply side economic development assessment. I suggest we need to think big about energy productivity, energy efficiency, and as you will see, about something we might call the third industrial revolution. 
Like any athlete, we want to warm up to the task. And I'm going to warm all of you up with some questions I'm going to ask and answer to give you a different sense of dimension and opportunity. The first question I will ask, other than population, what may be the single largest contributor to economic and environmental degradation? The single largest contributor, other than population, to environmental economic degradation. The answer I suggest, and this is founded on many deep studies, the large scale and inefficient use of energy. I think you'll be surprised at some numbers. And in fact, the United States, according to the work that Bob and I have done, the United States wastes 86% of all the energy we pull into the economic process. In other words, all the energy we throw at the economic problem, only 14% is useful in converting matter into the goods and services that we desire. Now, Europe is a little bit better, and Spain as well. Within the economic process, Europe perhaps 80 to 82% waste only much smaller waste, but even that is a very big number, and even that constrains the robustness of the economy. So the result of that, if we look at the numbers properly, that magnitude of waste, if we're wasting more than 80% of the energy we use in the economic process, you can imagine the large array of costs that severely constrain, that keep the economy from moving forward. So what I'm suggesting is the most immediate opportunity to ensure a more robust and sustainable economy is to quadruple, to increase by four times the current perhaps 18% level of energy efficiency, or as I like to say, level of energy inefficiency. Second question, what is the raspberry pie? This is interesting to me because it has a sociological implication, not so much a technical. The University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom noticed that they were having many PhD students who were applying for degrees in computer science, but none of them had gotten their hands on the insides of a computer, as we say in the US. None of them had mucked or messed with the computer. It was all done with software engineering. And we know, if we step back and think about it, we are at our creative best when we can get our brains and our hands physically involved together. And they asked a the question, why aren't students getting into the insides of computers and trying new wirings, trying new chips, trying new arrangements physically instead of through software technology approaches? And the reason is very obvious, because the computer is very costly. You wouldn't want to take a chance on causing damage to a $1,000 notebook, would you? They said, we need to solve that problem. So they got together with my colleagues from ARM. ARM is a microchip design firm in the UK, you probably have never heard of it, but the interesting thing about ARM is that more than 90% of all cell phones use their microchip design. So the University of Cambridge, my colleagues at ARM, got together and designed a new approach to computers, and we have the Raspberry Pi. Now here's a picture of my Raspberry Pi in my hand. This is my hand holding my Raspberry Pi. Imagine a credit card sized computer that can be plugged into your TV and your keyboard. Imagine that can be used for many different things, like the desktop PC does, but only more agile, more flexible, using things like spreadsheets, word processing, and high definition video games. Imagine that. But especially imagine that I paid only 42 euro on Amazon.com for this. 42 euro. What might that reduction in cost and size mean for prospective energy efficiency improvements? How might we capture those opportunities? How might we imagine the Raspberry Pi being part of the solution ways that were not available? We have desktop computing that brought computing power down to thousands of euros. We have netbooks that brought computing power down to hundreds of euros. And now we have the Raspberry Pi that can bring computing down to tens of euros. Doesn't that offer an amazing opportunity to move ahead in new ways that we perhaps had not imagined before? What is the record fuel economy of cars? Now, if I were to ask this question, the standard gasoline engine, a research vehicle, notice I'm saying research vehicle, it's not a typical consumer car, it's clearly a research vehicle. Some in the United States have ventured a guess of two liters per 100 kilometers. That might be um, 100 miles per gallon, roughly even a respectable one liter per 100 kilometers, 200 miles per gallon, roughly. Those are some of the guesses. 
I don't want to create a competition between Spain and France, but many have been surprised to learn that in 2003, a French team, French students, designers of the car, the Microjoule, participating in the Shell Eco Marathon, notice the integration universities with private industry working together collaboratively to design new ways of going about things, the Shell Eco Marathon, they achieved a rather astounding result in a gasoline engine of 0.03 liters, three hundredths of a liter per 100 kilometers. Who would have imagined that? In June 2005, again, the Federal Polytechnical School of Zurich, Albert Einstein's alma mater, set an even more impressive record for fuel efficiency, 0.02 liters per 100 kilometers, this time in a fuel cell vehicle, also as part of the Shell Eco Marathon. Now, why do I bring this up? Because I don't think we're ever going to see a car that you and I could easily get into, that we could pull our briefcase into, and we could comfortably drive that'll get that kind of fuel economy. That's not why I'm bringing this up. I bring it up because it's to suggest that after all these years, since the oil embargo of 73-74, we still know so little about how to extract maximum work, maximum value out of things like energy. We still know so little of how to pull maximum ingenuity out of people working in technolia. There is so much more that we can be doing if we'll venture on this journey together. Final question, what is the Bekenstein bound? Here I'm building on the foundations of information theory advanced by MIT graduate Claude Shannon in 1948. Princeton graduate student Jacob Bekenstein, hence the name, proved in 1973 there was a limit to the amount of information that could be stored in any given region or space. No surprise, there's a limit. There's always a limit. But what's remarkable about this? Contrary to expectation, the limit to information does not depend on volume, but on surface area. Some remarkable numbers coming up. Rough calculations suggest that the Bekenstein bound is 10 to the 70th bits per square meter, 10 to the 70th. Imagine 10 followed by 70 zeros bits per square meter. That's roughly the approximate limit. It'll vary depending on how you set that, that uh, approximation up, but that gives you the magnitude. Now, why do I throw that number out? Because by comparison, the compact disks we now use cram only 10 to the 13th bits per square meter. What does that mean? We're not even close to the physical frontier. We're moving back to Richard Feynman's plenty of room at the bottom. In other words, we still have 10 to the 57 times, 10 followed by 57 zeros of space available to store information. Imagine what we can do with that in ways of enabling new business models, new ways of tracking and, and building up new logistics and new ways of storing and using data. With that as a backdrop to warm up, huge opportunities if only we'll work together and create more collaborative approaches. I'm going to give you two slides uh, with reference to the Spanish economy that I hope will cause some heartburn. I'm looking now at four regions of the world comparing what we call their energy intensities. In this case, it's the number of, of uh, megajoules per US dollar of purchasing power. Okay. The top line is the United States, yes, the most wasteful among these four. In 1980, very high amount of energy per dollar of economic activity. But the good news is the United States has declined significantly, still well above other regions of the world, but there has been significant progress. The second line is the global economy, much lower than the world, and now the US and the world are approximately the same in terms of energy intensity, the same number of megajoules per dollar of economic activity. The EU 27 is the third line, that red line there. Lower than the US, lower than the world on average, with some progress, but here is Spain. It is the lowest among the four that I've shown. Other regions are better than Spain, other regions are worse than Spain, but here's Spain compared to those four. And I'm suggesting that yes, you're better off than the US, Yes, you're better off than the EU27 in terms of the amount of energy per dollar of economic activity, but Spain has not shown much progress in improving that, that, that number. And that may be a source, as we're saying, 
of the lagging productivity, the lagging robust economy. Now, the good news is Spain is not alone. I am seeing other nations, other nations from the developed and developing countries that are facing similar problems. You're not alone. But the interesting news is the global economy may have to pull down as an average across developed and developing nations down somewhere along the line I've suggested. We don't know the precise line, but we know that if we're going to build a sustainable economy, if we're going to move forward with a productive economy, we need to be pulling down that intensity through greater investments in energy efficiency, energy productivity. There is no choice. There is no choice. That absolutely has to be done. That means we need to tap into your expertise and make it available to the economy at large. Here is Spain. The average economy-wide growth rate in what I call uh, uh, ec economic productivity. Now, the numbers are very interesting in two ways. First of all, notice the huge volatility since 1980 of Spain, the annual change in GDP, the annual change in GDP, year-to-year -year change is very wild, very woolly, very chaotic. You've seen this yourselves, I know, that kind of volatility. But if you notice the slow downward trend, the economic activity is growing a little bit weaker, weaker, and weaker, and weaker. What is it going to take for us to realize that if we're going to do things as we did yesterday, we're going to get the same results as yesterday? If we want to take new steps forward, we need to begin thinking about new ways of doing things, new ways of imagining, new ways of bringing new materials, new designs into the marketplace, a new value-added proposition. Again. The weakening economy can be tied to the inefficient use of energy and other resources, not just energy alone, but that's the critical one. And this is by no means unique to Spain. There is a similar pattern within the US and, and the developed nations, and the developing nations as well. So it's not just a Spanish problem, it's a global problem. And how can we reach out and build much more collaboration to solve that problem? So the really big question I'm offering here today how do we translate these ideas into a value-added proposition? I've already referenced this. My suggestion? Create a roadmap to the third industrial revolution. Bear with me as I walk through some interesting things beginning to happen. As I'm suggesting, something potentially fascinating is unfolding now in Nord Pas de Calais. Nord Pas de Calais, I'm coming to find, has some remarkable similarities to the Basque region. It is a uh, region of about 4 million people, just a little bit more than the Basque region. It's up in northeastern France along the Belgian border and the English Channel. It's a maritime, a sea, food, uh, agricultural, heavy manufacturing economy. And like the Basques are seen by many of the Spanish, the cheese in uh, Nord Pas de Calais are seen that way by the French sort of uh, the backwards uh, part of uh, France that nobody wants to go to unless you're looking for a good time type of thing. But there is a lot of enterprise going on. This is a picture I took of the Chamber of Commerce's New Year's card they sent out to all of the people in Nord Pas de Calais at the beginning of this year. La troisième révolution industrielle commence. The third industrial revolution begins. That was in January. There are some interesting things going at work. And Iñaki San Sebastian and uh, Jesus de la Cantana were there among the contributors to our dialogue in Nord Pas de Calais, so they've already seen this at first hand. Probably the reason I'm here today is because they were there to see this first hand. And we're now beginning to see a different unfolding. The Chamber of Commerce now has its own website about the Third Industrial Revolution. But notice, before it says, La Revolution Industrielle commence, now they're saying, Revolution Industrial est en marche. It continues. It started and it continues. They have an active effort. I will describe that in a minute. This might be a role model for the Basque region. We have Philippe Dassour, who uh, I like because he's also the chairman of the French Brewers Association. So we have beer in common. That's, a, that's a quite a delight. But he's also a former banker who heads the Chamber of Commerce. Dassour says, Nous avons été les rois de la première révolution industrielle. We were the kings of the first industrial revolution. Well, I'll explain that in just a minute. He says, we suffered under the second industrial revolution. We cannot afford to miss the third. And I suggest to you, 
we are exactly in that point. We cannot afford to miss the third. And so far, I have not seen any alternative plan. There is no plan B. We need to move ahead with a positive step forward. And again, as, uh, as uh, Inyaki and Jesus observed, three days we had an active meeting in a chamber very much like this, over 300 participants, all agreeing we had a unanimous vote by the regional council, left, right, and center. We had unanimous participation from the Nud Pad Calais Chamber of Commerce. The president of the chamber, Philippe Dassur, was working with the president of the regional council, Daniel Pecheron, and with the head of the Green Party, Jean-Francois Caron all of them working in agreement to move ahead. And this is part of the scene that you observed. You can't see it, but we have Pecheron, Jean-Claude Cacheron, and Philippe Assur, Jeremy Rifkin, and I at the head with all of these 300 delegates in active discussion about developing the third industrial revolution, the master plan. Very similar region uh, to this area of Spain. Participer et devenir acteur. Participate and become an actor in the third industrial revolution. And the evidence is suggesting that indeed that is happening. I'm in fact leaving here tomorrow night late to go back to Lille, the capital of that region, and to begin working with uh, them yet again. So let me give you some context of how that came about. It was at the beginning of a remarkable talk by my colleague Jeremy Rifkin at the World Social Forum in Lille just last November. The seeds were planted to lift Nord Pad Calais onto the path of the third industrial revolution because the people themselves came forward to Jeremy and said, can you work with us to develop this master plan? Jeremy did not go to Lille to talk about Nord Pad Calais and the Third Industrial Revolution. He gave a speech. And the people from Nord Pad Calais said, Daniel Pecheron, the president of the region, Philippe Assur, the president of the chamber, said, can we work with you to develop a master plan that will be possible for Nord Pad Calais? As he lays it out in his best-selling book, Jeremy notes, that any time you have a coming together, a new form of communication and a new form of energy, you've laid the foundation for a new industrial revolution. This makes sense. Think about ourselves as biological entities. What is it that we really do? I hate to boil us down to a simple thing like this, but think about this. We are constantly taking in information. Information and processing it and deciding how to act on it. And then we use energy to actually carry out those actions. Communication, information, to understand the world around us, to know what the threats are, what the opportunities are. We're processing information all the time, and then we use energy to make that happen. In a very similar way, Jeremy suggested, anytime you have a new form of energy coming together with a new form of communication, you have the basis for a new prosperity, a new industrial revolution. So the first industrial revolution, yes, we had the movable type, the Gutenberg Bible in the late 1400s, but it really became an art form in newspapers and brochures and pamphlets in the 1700s. It's so about that time we began using steam as a major source of energy, relying on coal to drive the steam engine, the Newcomen engine, uh, and so on. The second industrial revolution from the 1700s to the late 1800s, maybe around 1900, the new form of communication was the telephone telegraph with the internal combustion engine and the electricity generation. And for better and for worse, we're still living off the residuals of the second industrial revolution. But as I'm going to suggest again in a minute, the returns on those technologies are diminishing. We need to think about moving forward to the third industrial revolution. Here's where Jeremy and I differ, differ a little bit. He's suggesting this is happening I'm suggesting it can happen. It's going to take purposeful effort to make it happen. So we have the emerging, the emerging but not at all guaranteed third industrial revolution. We have interactive communications, the digital economy, the active internet, and we have distributed clean energy technologies anchored by large scale efficiency improvements. That's the basis and concept for the third industrial revolution. It's a new platform, a new way of moving forward. So some further thoughts. I've already alluded to this a couple of times. The economic benefits and the returns on the second industrial revolution technologies are diminishing. Yes, they're still positive, but they're getting weaker and weaker, and our economies are beginning to suffer and suffer. We need to move forward with a more positive step. So a social and economic transformation, again, I emphasize, 
social and economic transformation, clearly needed, driven by purposeful effort that includes directed and targeted investments. I've already alluded to this. Hence, the development of the third Industrial Revolution Master Plan by the Rifkin team. The Rifkin team, which in the Todd Clay, I'm delighted to say, includes participation by Technology, as we'll see in a minute. In fact, just a week ago, we submitted the draft plan to Nordpad Calais, and I'm going up there to meet with them to work through some of the details. We will submit the final plan in October, but they're not waiting for our plan to be finished. They are already beginning to launch projects of their own. They have what they call their 100,000 homes to upgrade, eventually to begin thinking about reducing energy use in homes by 75%. They're already evaluating how to make that happen even before we deliver that final plan at the World Social Forum in Lille in October. They're moving. They're not waiting for the written document. And the more productive and efficient use of all energy resources absolutely must underpin this transformation over the next four decades. We're looking out to the year 2050. Imagine, 2050. Some of the players of the Rifkin team include Acciona, from here from Spain. We've got, uh, obviously, um, EDRF. We've got uh, Electricity de France. We've got Philips Orange. We've got uh, the French National Railroad, the SCNS, SCNCF. Uh, we've got, uh, you see at the very bottom, because it's all alphabetical, Technalia is among the participants. A very active corporate participation in dialogue, active communication with the Regional Council and with the Chamber of Commerce. Here are the five pillars, as Jeremy refers to, the five pillars of the third industrial revolution. We've got, first of all, pillar one, a shift to renewable energy technologies. I want to emphasize that new materials, new designs, are bringing the costs of renewable energy technologies down very dramatically, making them increasingly competitive. We've got to open up the markets to them to make sure that that continues. And we've got people in Nodpad Calais the big exciting part, this is not just a top down, we've got 120 participants in each of these eight working groups I'm going to describe here. They're not just sitting around talking, they're actively researching, they're actively reaching out to people that might help them develop projects. They're actively engaging in this process and we are learning from them even as we're working to develop the master plan. So pillar one, the shift to renewable energy technology. The costs are declining dramatically, and they are becoming increasingly important to the economy. This pillar two is buildings as micropower plants. Imagine a building that's so efficient with renewable energy technologies that it can have surplus electricity developed back to others that may need it at that moment in time. Pillar three is storage technologies, because we need to store some of that energy to make it available at key po points when the sun may not be shining and the wind may not be blowing, but we need that power. Pillar four is what Jeremy refers to the energy internet. Imagine that electricity, hydrogen, natural gas, all may be competing with each other because we've been able through new materials, new designs, to bring down the delivery of useful work of energy at a point in a precise amount that's needed at the right time, at the right place. Today I may be using hydrogen. In an hour I may be using natural gas. Tomorrow I may be using electricity powered by renewables. Photovoltaics may be generating and hydrolyzing water to create that hydrogen. All in an active internet, a smart interaction of connected networks that allow this kind of possibility. The energy internet may be a critical part. We think of it as smart grid. Uh, Jeremy and I prefer to think of it as the energy internet. And then we have a very smart transportation system with plug-in and fuel cell transport. Mobility, as the French like to say, getting goods and services to where they need, or to reduce the need to ship goods and services altogether because you have things like 3D manufacturing. You can print manufactured products closer to where you need them. You're reducing the need for mobility. Now, to their credit, the French have taken us two steps further. They've added in a working group to explore what we call the functional economy. That's to say, how to improve the transversality of the working groups, the cross linkages, how the left brain and the right brain might do a better job of collaborating and generating new ideas and being inspired and picking up on the ideas of others. And then the last working group is what we call the circular economy, how wastes from one part of the economy become input, become feedstocks, become useful products for other parts of the economy, how to make that possible, how to reduce waste, how to recycle more, 
how to think of waste as raw materials, as ingredients for other parts of the economy. Eight working groups, 120 participants working actively with myself, with Jeremy, with the corporate participants in the Rifkin team. Very exciting dynamic. Now this may be the most important slide of this talk, I say this as an economist, because this is what's going to drive forward the economy. It's gonna be a little bit complicated, let me walk you through it. We have on the vertical axis, the y-axis, energy. Energy expenditures, energy use, however you wanna think about it. We have that over here. And we may have in the year 2020, it could be 2014, it could be 2030, it could be 2050, any year you choose we're gonna have some estimate of what the total cost of energy services are, not just energy, but the capital and the labor to deliver that energy and the consequences of using that energy, the social, the economic, the health, and the environmental costs. That's gonna create a set of costs. Our job is to spend more money. Imagine that, not austerity, but to spend more money. We have to spend more money on programs and policies to drive forward new investments that allow us then to bring the total costs down. It has to be a purposeful effort. There has to be a plan to guide this, to understand what the starting costs are, the full starting costs, more policy program effort. Yes, it requires effort. It takes expenditure to drive forward. It takes investment. As the business world says, it takes money to make money. We have to make the investment to generate the returns and then bring the total cost down so that the costs that result are lower than they were when we started. This has to happen each year, year after year. The total cost of energy services must decline. So the combination of energy efficiency and new energy resources must be able to reduce the real cost of energy services each year successively, each year. That cost has to come down. Are we up to that task? I get a lot of questions about shale gas. I answer the question, can shale gas, while it may be cheaper than some future alternatives, can it bring costs down to less than we're paying today? I don't care what the resource is, whether it's coal, whether it's oil, whether it's nuclear, whether it's renewables, whether it's efficiency, some combination, some mix of those complete resources absolutely needs to bring the total cost of energy services down year after year in order for the economy to move ahead. There is no plan B, there is no other choice if we're interested in a robust economy. Physicist John Wheeler, a uh, emeritus professor who died at Princeton, uh, uh, died just a few years ago, uh, was a physicist you may never have heard of, but you probably know his ideas among the phrases he's coined as black hole. Uh, one of his students was, in fact, Richard Feynman. He should have won the Nobel Prize, never did. I first heard him in the 70s. Yes, I go back that far. He was responding to a question by some reporters, and again, this might be helpful for Technalia. And the reporter's saying, how the heck are you guys coming up with some of these weird ideas in physics? And he said, very simply, we shape the world by the questions we ask. I want to pose some more questions. The iceberg. My question, are we living more by waste than ingenuity? And I'll tell you about the United States. I've done a simple calculation for the United States. I've added up all the carbon dioxide emissions we emit in the United States. I've added all the municipal solid waste we've generated in the United States. And then I've added all the soil losses from the erosion of soil as we do farming. Turns out that for every bite of food we eat, we in the United States lose about six bites of soil. That is huge. So just carbon dioxide, solid waste, and soil, added them all up and divided by the income in the United States. Turns out for every dollar of income, we waste about 0.6 kilos of material. For every dollar of income, we generate 0.6 kilos of waste. Are we living more by waste than ingenuity? And in the case of Europe, you may be doing better than the US, but is 18% efficiency adequate? And how does that thinking of business as usual energy consumption limit our view? My suggestion is we tend to see only the very narrow top of the iceberg, the very narrow tip of what is possible 
We need to ask more questions like John Wheeler does or like Richard Feynman, plenty of room at the bottom. There is much more that we can be doing if we step back and shape the world by the questions we ask. For Nerd Pod Calais, the numbers are beginning to look like this. We've explored the full efficiency potential. We think that there is about 800 million barrels of efficiency equivalent, 800 million barrels of oil equivalent in the form of energy through the year 2050. That is about an eight to 10 year supply of energy at current levels of consumption. I think it'd be bigger. But imagine going eight to 10 years over the next 35 without using any energy at all because you're performing so much more productively. That's the possibility. And that's what Nodpad Calais is doing. They're saying, can we cut energy use in half by 2050? Cut energy use in half by 2050 and power the entire rest of our energy needs completely with renewables. Eliminate their nuclear. They're asking that question as part of our master plan. We're telling them they have to spend 200 billion euros to do it. They did not kick me out of the room when I said that. They're actively beginning to think how to frame an investment plan of 200 billion euros over the next 35 years that will bring energy consumption down by half and still provide 160,000 more jobs for that regional economy. Asking new questions. How much for Spain? That's a question I think we could address together. So my closing remarks to the meeting in Nodpad Calais last May, I suggested that if Nodpad Calais wants to reduce its energy use by half through efficiency by about 2050, and imagining all the work that needs to be done on the infrastructure as well as individual technologies to make that possible, and bringing in the renewable energy technologies, they need to think about spending the equivalent of three to five billion euros each year for the next 35 years, about 5% of GDP. Since I've written the plan, uh, it's now about 6%. It's gone up a little bit, but that gives you the sense. And I said at the same time, the gains in productivity, a more robust economy as a result of these productive investments could stimulate the regional economy in the year 2020 by another 4 billion euros. There are about 90 billion now. So another 4 billion of stimulated activity because of the productive investment, because of the effort and the mounting savings that are beginning to happen by 2020, and more like 20 billion euros in the year 2050. 160,000 jobs a year by 2050, an average of 100,000 more jobs a year over that entire span. So I asked this question, is Nord Pad Calais are they thinking big enough and far enough to seize the full opportunities associated with energy efficiency and integrating greater efficiencies through the five pillars of the Industrial Revolution? That potential is what we're exploring in the master plan we've just turned over to them just a week ago. And I hope to be able to share with all of you. As Maynard Keynes, the UK economist, said in the 1930s in the foreword to his book, the difficulty lies not with the new ideas, but in escaping the old ones. Or as my German colleagues, uh, quick sketch artists did, this was their take of my talk, uh, the difficulty is to escape the old way of thinking. Or as Einstein said, if you do what you did yesterday and you expect different results, isn't that the test of insanity? To always do what you've done before and expect different results? We need to be doing things differently. We need to take new steps forward and ask better questions to shape the world ahead. And with that, Delighted to be here. Thank you for your attention. I hope we continue the dialogue.